Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today we're going to be talking about family business and specifically how family business owners think so that you can be a resource to them and help them. Okay? I'm a big believer in the fact that if we help our clients, the money will come. Mm -hmm. And let's do what's right for the client, right? Let's do what's right for the customer. The money will roll in if we do what's right. So there are some things that I have to recommend for you that can help you be a better resource. Okay, you need me to talk louder? How's that? Okay, will do. Okay. Let me start with a relatively humorous story. So imagine, hard day at work, father and son come home, they decide to take a dip in the jacuzzi, they're sitting there relaxing, and all of a sudden the dad looks at the son and says, son, your mother and I have been talking. We've asked you to improve your performance for the last six months. Nothing's changed. I'm sorry. We're going to have to let you go. <laughs> Son's devastated. He just got fired from his dad. And then the dad takes off his boss hat, puts on his dad hat, and says, Son, I understand you had a tough day at work today. <laughs> Is there anything we can do to help? So that, in a little tiny nutshell just talks a little bit about the complexity of family firms and the complexity that the business owner has. So, all right, let's get started. So today we're going to be talking about all of this stuff. I will try to blow through a lot of this because the part that you really want to know about is at the end on how you can help these people, but I, I would like you to understand how they think and why they think the way that they do, okay? So they are different. We're going to talk about a definition of family firms. Um, they are extremely prevalent, extremely prevalent. We'll talk about the good parts, we'll talk about the bad parts, and then we'll talk about uh, the challenges that they have in owning a family-owned business with multiple family members. Uh, McElhenney Tabasco sauce, 140 family shareholders. Imagine trying to make a decision there. <laughs> So we'll talk about how they do make decisions. I'll talk to you a little bit about what you should do at the very beginning of a meeting with them to assess where they are, and then what you should do as advisors to help them, and I will give you a huge missed opportunity which quite possibly could allow you to have your, your fee paid for with the advice that you give to these family business owners. All right. So here's my experience. I was a second gen member of my own family business for 17 years. Uh, I did my dissertation on the subject of family business decision making. Fascinately, fascinating. Uh, my dad is 90 and he likes control and he just now started a trust and gave over the business to my brother, my sister, and, and myself at 90. Um, anyway, I teach a class, I advise companies. I do research, I publish and write. Uh, let's see, the last one is of interest to you. Um, it's in process right now, we're going through a couple of revisions. We did the first study of Christian-owned, multi-generational family-owned firms, okay? All right, so here's why they're different. Think back to your last Christmas, or your last Thanksgiving, with, <laughs> with your extended family. You know that one uncle, that one cousin? Now imagine that your entire wealth, 90% of your wealth is tied up with these people, mm. and your employment as well. Mm. Fun times, okay? <laughs> All right, so they do have unique challenges. Imagine Mary Barra, GM's CEO. She gets a divorce. Does GM even notice? Just keeps on going. Right? Now imagine a family firm where mom and dad work there, children work there, cousins, uncles, and the founders get a divorce. We're talking destructive. We're talking dysfunction, right? It, it has a chance of going down, okay? Um, massive complexity versus non family firms. They have the same everyday challenges that a non family firm has. Now add in the family dynamic on top of it, all the extra stuff. Right? Junior wrapping the truck around the tree for the third time. <laughs> right? And, and you can't fire him because he's somebody's relative. Okay? So here's one thing 
This is the thing that they think about before they make a decision. Especially in a multi-generational firm, the legacy of the founder is vital. It's paramount. If grandma and grandpa started the firm, it went to your parents, and now you have it, the first thing you think of when you make a decision is how does my decision affect grandma and grandpa's legacy? I don't want to do anything that would harm it. Okay? It, they, it, it takes a millisecond, but every decision that they make, they want to make sure that they're honoring the legacy that came before them. Because quite frankly, by the time it gets to the third gen, they're either bankrupt or well off, right? But if they're well off, they don't, they don't want to do anything to harm that reputation. Okay? Um, the values, the mission, the vision, these are not just buzzwords. You can actually go to Google and buy a mission statement for $300 pre-made. That defeats the purpose of a mission statement. In a family business, the mission is huge. It is the differentiating factor between why is this family in business together and why are we different than non-family firms? What do we have that's special and different? Okay. Uh, here's a good one. Um, Socio-emotional wealth concept. This, in a nutshell, explains. This is fascinating. Uh, this, a lot of research has been done on this recently, and it is so fascinating. Have you ever heard of a family firm getting a buyout offer? Mm -hmm. And it's valued way above what the true value is. They're, they're, they're willing to pay them two to three times the value of this company, right? Any one of us would take it. A family says, hmm, no thanks. What would we do? This is our identity. This is grandma and grandpa's legacy. This is our standing in the community. It's all wrapped up in our business. We can't sell. No, no, we don't want to. And they would turn it down. It frustrates outside advisors, frustrates people to death, right? And that explains some of their altruistic behavior that sort of looks like they're shooting themselves in the foot. But in actuality, it's quite rational. Okay. All right, they have differing goals of each generation. Okay, uh, the Paris Hilton concept, you know, third gen. She can do whatever she wants, right? Uh, sometimes we have businesses, and by the time it gets to the third gen, they're well off, uh, well enough off where they don't have to enter the family firm. So they can go do underwater basket weaving if that's what they want to do. They can go be a poet. They can go take some weird major at the university, and they don't have to join the junkyard business like the generations that came before them. Um, here we go, numerous hidden decision makers. So I'm calling on the CEO of the family business. Would you all agree that if you call on the CEO, you're, you're, you're there? That's the top decision maker? Yeah, not so much. No. Uh, grandma is around the corner, and grandma has strong thoughts on what should and should not be done. So um, you need to understand during this assessment, when you first meet them, how many family members are there, um, who is still there, even though they don't work there as an employee. Okay? Uh, slower decision making. When it is a decision that's important to the rest of the family, the decision making is extremely slow. It frustrates outside advisors. It frustrates business people trying to sell them. Okay? And as I don't need to tell you this, but with the baby boom generation retiring, there is a massive transfer of intergenerational wealth. This is a huge opportunity for you to be of service to those clients. Yes, 90% of their wealth is tied up in the business. So some of you say, it's all tied up in the business. I have nowhere to go. I can't make money off of them, right? Well, at some point soon, they are going to need some advice on how to transfer the sale of this business to their son or to next family members, things like that, and there is an opportunity for you. Uh, relatively recent, we now have exit planners, um, SEPA, you know, exit, uh, exit uh, planning advisors, things like that, that are perfect for CFPs to go in and be a resource to their, to their clients. Here we go. So we have to start with a definition. Um, there are actually, sorry I'm a geek on this stuff, 34 different definitions of family business. That's fun when you read one study that says one thing and you read another study that says the exact opposite. It's because we're dealing with two different definitions. Okay? So anyway, two or more people related to each other by blood or marriage. Makes sense, right? They have an ownership stake. They have enough of an ownership stake to uh, institute strategic direction in the firm. Right? Here's the one that kicks a lot of people out the intention to keep the business in the family. If it is a husband and a wife, 
yes, that's a family business. However, that's a copreneurship, and it's just regular. I think many of you are in business with your spouses, so it's just regular business with the same old issues that husbands and wives have, and I think we're all familiar with that. Okay? But the big issue here is the intent to keep the business in the family. That's important because, because of that. That's why they make decisions differently. Here we go. So uh, mom and pops is actually a derisive term. Family firms do not like being called a mom and pop, and they're embarrassed about what that means. When we say the word, when we say the term mom and pop, we get unprofessional, poorly managed, things like that come into our mind, right? Well, if we were in Europe, 80% of us would be working for family-owned firms that are hundreds of years old. It's not a mom and pop over there. It's not a der derisive term. Okay? In America, family firms are responsible for 64% of all the employment, the majority of all new jobs. Think about all the new, think about all the small businesses that are in this country. 80% of them are family-owned. Okay? Um, this Studies, these studies, this data right here, one third of the Fortune 500 is either family owned or controlled, and one third of the S&P 500 duplicated it. It's either family owned or family controlled. I did a study of 10 years of the Forbes 400 richest people in America, and 44% either got their money from the family firm or they own a family firm presently. That's, that's huge. I mean, look at, the, look at the impact on our economy, right? Um, over 500 worldwide have sales over $10 billion. This is not mom and pop. This is not small business anymore. Remember, everyone started out small. So I mentioned family owned versus family controlled. Okay? So real quick, the first three up there are actually Christian owned companies, right? Chick-fil-A, In-N-Out, Hobby Lobby. The Green family started making picture frames on their kitchen table in the 60s and turned into Hobby Lobby. Okay? Um, Chick-fil-A, Andrew Cathy has come to my class and spoke a couple of times. He is now, just as of about six weeks ago, now the new CEO of Chick-fil-A took over from his dad, and he's now the third generation CEO of the Cathy family at Chick-fil-A, 100% privately held. So all of those firms on the top line are what we call family-owned. This is the, for you, this is the local dry cleaners. This is the local drugstore, right, where the family owns the entire business. The ones down at the bottom are controlled by families. I think an interesting one is Ford. The Ford family has controlled Ford Motor Company for over 100 years, yet they only own 2% of the stock. They have 40% voting control of Ford Motor Company with 2% of the stock. That's because their stock is worth a heck of a lot more than our stock is. They have super voting rights associated with their stock, something like 10 votes to every one. Right? Uh, you can see some of the others there. Walmart, the largest corporation in the world. There's a Walton family member that sits on the board. Okay. All right. So let's talk about some of the strengths of family businesses. Here we go. This is a confounding one at the very top in the fact that they make decisions for the long term. And what I mean by that is they are thinking of, well, every time I make a decision, it's not like a non-family executive would make a decision to pop up the stock price for short-term gain for, the, for this quarter. They don't make decisions like that because they're looking 10, 15, 20 years down the road when their children take over. They're making decisions that would benefit their children. Now on the flip side, I'll also show you that that's a weakness that they don't do a good job on because they're still running it without a strategic plan and they oftentimes just do the day-to-day -day fire drill kind of thing that many companies do, okay? Um, Credit Suisse in 2018, um, and this is some interesting data here, shows that family firms actually have superior financial performance compared to non-family firms. What's fascinating is we can actually learn a lot from these people, especially multi-generational firms. We can learn a lot from them. What are they doing right to overcome all of the issues that a non-family firm has, plus <coughs> that whole family dynamic thing that comes in all the time, okay? This is neat. Better performance in a recession because they are more conservative. I had a client in um, Southern California, and they had, it was a small, 75-year-old, second-generation run jewelry store. They had $600,000 in cash. 
waiting for the apocalypse to happen. That was it. Waiting for the apocalypse. Third gen is frustrated, wants to start another store. Come on, Dad, let's go. We've got great brand awareness. We've got customers that have been with us for generations. Let's start a new store on the, on the uh, site of town that's really growing. Oh, no, no, no. They were the second gen. They still had to worry about the first gen at the top that they were supporting in retirement, and then they had to worry about the third gen still in their homes, and so they feel incredible pressure being the second generation in the middle. That's why they were so conservative. So they can literally make it through the apocalypse on that one. Uh, they're also slower to lay off employees. I was doing my dissertation, and I happened to interview this one gentleman, and, and it was during the um, Great Recession, and he said, see that lady over there? And it was the bookkeeper. He said, I can't fire her. No business is coming in. They were in the real estate industry. No business is coming in. She's got nothing to do. But I can't get rid of her. She's family, right? My mom hired her 40 years ago. So um, actually, for the lower level employees and middle level employees, family firms are really great places to work really great places to work. Where it tops out is you, you just know you're not going to get that top job, right? Nepotism's coming in there. All right. So they treat employees like family. This is fun. A family firm lives longer than a non-family firm. Interesting. Success rates are extremely high. Extremely high. Two times. Here's a good one. The tenure of a family CEO is 24 years. Think about it. How good would you be at your job if you did it for 24 years? Versus seven for a non-family CEO, because they're moving to the next big thing, right? They, they want stock options, they're going to go to the next larger corporation and get more money and then jump again and go get more money, where obviously we have loyalty with the family CEO. This also becomes a problem in what we call found, founder centrality or the shadow of the founder. Sometimes they can stay too long. And you know this is the way we've always done it. I don't see why we need to have social media. I don't see why we need to have a Twitter account, things like that. And they can stay too long. So that's an interesting balance that we have to do. Uh, one of the biggest impacts on family-owned businesses have been they just discovered that women exist. So back in the day, it used to be the firstborn son. If you think about Latin and South America, if you think about some countries in Europe, it didn't matter if a woman was born first. The, the heir was the firstborn son. And now that is going away because succession is the biggest problem that we have in family business. And they have realized, hey, these ladies are just as good as the guys, and they're doing extremely well. Uh, also, it is a... I have to say this diplomatically. A, a Fortune 500 firm, a woman gets hired, she does well, she trains a few people, and after about the second or third time of the person that she trained taking the top job because happens to be a male, and she hits the glass ceiling, she goes and starts either her own family firm or um, joins her family's business. So it, it, the increase in women has been dramatic in the last couple decades. Here's an interesting one and very important for you to be a help to your family business customers. They give significantly more charitable gifts and who they give it to is they, they feel very strongly that this community made us wealthy and the money for the most part stays in the community. And they, they like to give to education, they like to give to children, and for many of them, they give to churches and religious organizations. Those are the three main things that they give to, but they keep it in the community so that it can do some good because their identity is in that community, their social identity is in the community, and it's extremely important to them. Um, Edelman's Trust Barometer in 2016 did a family business special issue, and they found that there is this incredible amount of trust with a family-owned firm compared to a non-family-owned firm. And this is from consumers. They studied 15,000 consumers, so I think we can have confidence it was done well. And they said that they would rather buy twice as much. It was like 66% to 32%. The average American consumer would rather buy from a family-owned business where you can look them in the eye and their name's on the front door rather than a nameless, faceless conglomerate. 
because you know you're going to get good service and if there's a problem, they're going to take care of it because their reputation's at stake. I will talk a little bit more about that later. Succession, it deserves its own slide. The other challenges are on the following slide. Succession is the holy grail of family business. This is success or failure right here. This is the intergenerational wealth transfer, success or failure right here. So here we go, statistics are not quite good here. Only 30% succeed from the first to the second, 10 to 15% from the second to the third, only 4% have a successful transition of leadership to the fourth generation, and with the new generations, the millennials and the Gen Zs, I'm not going to knock them, I teach them. They are impressive, they very are so much impressive. I see so many that are, you know, don't worry, we're gonna be in good shape. However, they take a long time making up their mind and, and it frustrates the rest of the family members and they're saying, I don't know. I don't know if I want to take over. I don't know what I want to do. And they take a longer time making up their mind than, than we did. So those stats are starting to go down a little bit with the newer generations, okay? So succession has been called the final act of greatness. Imagine this, um, a pastor, I think this has happened to several people. Have you ever been involved in a fast growing church and the pastor died and it sort of fell apart, right? Or think about a business where the CEO was this great charismatic uh, leader and didn't develop the people under him and when he left, the business faltered. So for family firms, succession has been called the final act of greatness. If you're truly a great leader, if you're truly um, a fantastic CEO, then you would develop the people under you, including your family members. And succession is a process. It's a long-term process. Here's another benefit you can be to your clients. You need to get them started thinking about successor, succession um, and successor identification. It's at least a five-year process. Let's identify who the potential successors are. Let's put them through identify what their good parts are and their challenges are and do what we need to do to make them the best qualified successor. Choose one and, and that way um, we have a higher chance of succeeding. Here we go, a dismal statistic again. Uh, gee, I need some more positive statistics. I need to make this thing a little bit more fun. Um, look at this. The family business has a higher chance of going bankrupt due to the failure of having a succession, then due to the economy, then due to competition. Think about that. Non-family business, they just have to worry about the competition and the economy, right? These people have to worry about choosing their brother-in-law as the leader or their cousin, something like that, okay? Of the family firms that failed and went bankrupt, 77% did so because of the death of the founder. Here's what we're trying to avoid. What we're trying to avoid is what happens sometimes to students in my classrooms. They'll get a phone call, they're 20 years old. They get a phone call, mom says, I need you to come home. Dad's in the hospital with a heart attack. I need you to come home, I need you to run the business. Well, that 20 year old doesn't know the banker, doesn't know the suppliers, doesn't know the customers doesn't know the employees, and all of a sudden he's going to go home and run the company, or she's going to go home and run the company. The risk here is, I think you can all agree, most businesses have some debt. The risk here is if the banker doesn't feel comfortable, they're going to pull in the loan. And now you've got a cash flow crisis. And if the suppliers don't feel comfortable, I had a 40-year 40 re relationship with your mom, with your dad. I don't know you. And all of a sudden now it's COD instead of terms of 30 and 60 days. And again, cash flow crisis. That's why these firms go bankrupt. And you know what that does to the wealth of the family. Okay, all right. So here's what we recommend. You send Junior to college. He learns some skills. Then they go out and get a job on their own without any family help so that they have the pride in themselves that they earned that job in their own right, not just because of their right last name. Get promoted, find success again. Oh, under my own ability, I was able to get promoted. I feel good about myself, right? 
And then, if they're interested, join the family business later at some point in time, five years down the road, 10 years down the road. I didn't have this in my slide, but really, really quick. Um, when dad is 50 years old and son is 20, conflict. This conflict doesn't happen between dad and daughters. Less, significantly less conflict. The conflict that happens between dad and daughters is more on the daughter's part, where dad is not accepting her as CEO material. He sees her as his little girl, little princess, things like that. And, he, he, and same with the brother. They treat the unfortunate daughter like that. So she sort of has to fight for her, for her due there. Okay? But this is what we recommend. And the thing that will happen here are three different things. The employees will respect that particular person instead of just, who's this guy coming in bossing me around? I've been here for 40 years, who's this guy, <coughs> right? So they won't cut him off at the knees, okay? Um, the parents will respect him. Remember, change their poop diapers, right? So, you know, they'll accept them with the new skills that they bring back. And they'll bring back accounting skills, they'll bring back finance skills, they'll bring back the new modern types of technology and social media that many of these firms need, right? Um, and, and, so, and they will also respect themselves as well. Okay, all right. So here we go. Poor communication. Uh, pretty rampant. Think, think to your family's communication. Do you have fantastic, transparent, full communication? Okay. Uh, interpersonal conflict. Here we go. Cain and Abel. Extremely dysfunctional, destructive, tragic, right? And I like to remind you, they were on the first family farm in the very first family business, the very beginning of time. This is an old thing we're talking about. Ineffective decision making. You know why ineffective decision making? Because that one powerful leader makes most of the decisions alone. Uh, and then here's that confounding thing. I mentioned that it's a strength that they think long term into the future, but they really don't have a strategic plan on how they're going to get there. And they mostly do day to day kind of thing. This is something that you can be a help to your family business clients on. They feel alone. They feel lonely. When they get into the car to go home, they turn on the radio. The news is not talking about the problems that they're having with their brother in law. The news is talking about some stocks that increased by a certain percentage, right? So there's no radio for them. There's no TV when they, when they turn on CNBC in the morning. They're not talking about family-owned businesses, right? There's no news, okay? So the answer to many of these problems is governance. So number one, how we're going to increase communication and mitigate conflict is by having more family meetings. A family meeting is extremely informal. Let's go to breakfast, let's go to lunch, there's no agenda, but dad or mom explains why they're making the decision a certain way. And everyone is informed, here's what's happening, I understand now, I'm on the same page. Okay? Um, the family council, this is a family meeting on steroids, this has an agenda. People <laughs> vote, even though that powerful stockholder is going to win the majority of the votes because they have the majority of the shares, at least once we, it's human nature. If we have our say and everyone gets to raise their hand and say, I believe this, I think about this, what about that, did you think about this? If you have your say, even if it goes against you, at least you were heard and you will accept <coughs> the decision as it was made and support it when you leave that, when you leave that room. This is formal, with an agenda, and many times in order to keep that powerful decision maker from dominating the entire meeting, oftentimes this is led by a professional facilitator. All right. This is one of my favorites, a family constitution. This is what I do oftentimes when I go out to talk to my family business clients. This is um, a written document. We put in the mission of the company, the vision, the purpose, everyone agrees to it. And then we go through about 200 questions and we're trying to head off problems before they happen. Uh, what happens when uh, there's a substance abuse problem? What happens on the first instance of a family member? What happens on the second? What happens on the third? And everyone agrees. They all contribute in the creation of this document. And it's a living document. It can be updated. But at the end of going through 200 possible scenarios, 
car policy, compensation policy, how much vacation. I mean, these are conflict areas. These are things ripe with conflict. He's got a nicer car than I did. How come he gets a $70,000 car? I got a $50,000 car. That causes conflict, right? So let's put it in writing and everyone agrees to it, right? How do we terminate a family member? How do we allow a family member to enter the family business? Let's get it all discussed up front before we're faced with an emotionally charged issue. And this is extremely helpful in preventing conflict to happen in the first place. And all you have to do is go back to the Constitution and say, well, we're faced with this situation. You signed your name here. We all agreed. Everyone knew the guidelines and the rules. Okay. It's extremely helpful. And then a board of advisors. If we were a publicly held firm, we would have an official board of it, a board of uh, directors. And they would have power, wouldn't they? They have, actually have the power to hire and fire the CEO. They have power of oversight over the entire corporation. <coughs> Family firms, we do. Every corporation has to have a board of directors, but if yours is like mine, it's me and my wife, right? And we go to the Cheesecake Factory and have a meeting, right? And it's not really super effective. So what would be extremely helpful to this organization is having a board of advisors. They don't have power. They only give advice, and you don't have to take their advice. You just listen and see if you can get a different viewpoint. I was working with a, a contractor in Riverside, and it was an interesting story. He said, Dad started this company. Dad taught me everything I know. Dad hired half the people here. I hired the other half. So everyone knows what everyone knows. And they're getting no outside advice. They, they all think the same. That's not great for being proactive. That's not great to handle the competition. That's not great for advancing in the marketplace. You need some outside uh, advice. So what we recommend is you bring in an outside accountant. Bring in an outside marketing expert. Bring in an outside attorney. If you're going to undergo a succession, we recommend that companies bring in some family business that's recently undergone a succession to hear how they did it, things like that. So you want outside advice. And this does not threaten family because they don't have to take the advice. But it's, ooh, you know, that was a good idea. Possibly I should listen to these people. They're quite successful. All right. Family retreats. This is an area of opportunity for you. This is another governance tool that we use. Uh, usually a family business consultant will facilitate a family retreat. Uh, imagine how wealthy some of your family business clients are. They can go to the beach, they can go to the mountains, they probably own some things there, and they can bring in the extended family for a nice three-day weekend, and it's a bit of a vacation and work trip at the same time. And this is where the family institutes their values to the next generation, even as little children. They get taught, this is what grandma and grandpa did. And, they, and this is where you start putting into them the, uh, the wish from the family to be charitable, to, to have philanthropic goals, and you start them young that way. So this is an opportunity for you to sponsor a family retreat, sponsor a lunch, pay for a dinner, and give them an educational um, discussion for the whole family, right? So here we go, how to promote to the family business owner. So understand their issues. This is on the very first, it's what I do when I call on family firms. You may have a different way of doing business in your particular industry, but at some point in time, towards the beginning of your working with a family business, you should understand their issues. And I have an assessment, which I'll, I'll um, send to you on email at the end if you request it, okay? Um, perform this assessment, a bunch of questions. How many family members are there? What are their generations? Who works there? Who doesn't work there? How many stockholders are there? We wanna find those hidden people, those hidden decision makers that come out of the woodwork, okay? So we wanna know how many involved family members from each generation, um, the age of the business, okay? and who makes decisions. So my dissertation was on 
second generation family business decision making. When I first started my pilot study, I walked into these firms and I said, how do you make a decision? And you know what the flippant answer was? Flippant, sorry. <laughs> flippant, flippant answer. It was, well, rationally, of course. Everyone just said that. Well, I make decisions rationally. Guess what? Not true. No. No, we don't make decisions rationally. Humans don't make decisions rationally. They do what's called satisficing. They find the first answer that possibly does good enough, and there we go, we're off to the races. That's how they do it, okay? Anyway, I actually studied how they make decisions. What is the process for making decisions? Okay. Here we go, be aware of the hidden family members. You may be calling on someone that you think has the power to do what you would like, and they have to go get it checked out by someone else, and so now you sort of spent a lot of time thinking you're calling on the decision maker, and in actuality you weren't. That's sales 101. Uh, young salespeople often call on the wrong person, right? Okay. Um, the first, here we go, we're gonna talk about each one of the generations and how you should handle or deal with each of these members in your business, okay? So, the first gen, the founder, the original entrepreneur. Let's face it, these people are risk takers, right? This is the person who had the wherewithal to take a risk and start this business. Now, oftentimes, think about it. Uh, let's say it's a guy, he's a contractor, and he knows how to frame homes, and he's really great at it, and he gets the bright idea that I'm gonna start a construction company framing homes. What does he know? He knows how to frame homes. He's really great at it, right? Does he know the financials? No. Right? Does he know how to manage people? Not so much. Right? So that's what they know. And that's oftentimes when they tell the second gen, you know, oh, be quiet, we're successful, do it my way. Because, you know, I built this company. So when you're calling on these people, first gen, especially founders, entrepreneurs, okay, decisions are easy. They're just like any other business to you. They're just like any other businessman. Decisions are easy. Okay? They're fast. Treat them as any other client. Okay? Now remember, if it's a husband and wife, a little bit more complexity. You can imagine making decisions with your spouse. Right? We need to communicate a little bit more. It would be ideal if you get both of them. Okay? Um, but make sure you talk to both equally because you do not know who has the power. There is a large electrical contractor in my area that do about $200 million a year. I thought, I, I put my foot in my mouth, I thought that it was a minority-owned firm just for the gimmick of being allowed to bid on government contracts and things like that. Oh, no. Mom started it. Mom is the power, not dad. <laughs> I just assumed that it, since it was an electrical contractor that the male started this business. Oh, no. Mom is very much the power, very much in charge. So woe to the professional advisor that goes in there and assumes that, that the man started it and not her. Ooh, that would not be good. So you treat them all equally. You do not know who has the power, okay? Um, ask them, when, have they thought about succession? What are they going to do when they retire, right? Have they thought about succession? If so, when will it occur, okay? And then, of course, do you know the dismal statistics in a family-owned firm in your business? You've developed a client for, I don't know, 30 years, let's say, and it's a family-owned business, and then they have a transfer of ownership to the second gen. Do you know those statistics? That there's a high chance that you're not going to continue on with that client, that that next gen is going to pick another financial advisor? So you need to develop a relationship with that next generation before they rise to power, okay? And you can do that through helping them <coughs> and with educational events, okay? All right, so let's talk about the second generation. I, I sort of tip this off with that discussion about the jewelry, the jewelry store, right? So they have pressure. Um, they have this massive amount of respect for the generation that came in front of them, massive. Many of them will actually say, I couldn't do what mom and dad did. I can run this now, no problem, but I'm not a risk taker and I never would have started this business. So they have this intense respect and admiration for what mom and dad did above them and they don't want anything going wrong 
<coughs> based on their decisions, okay? All right, uh, the second gen is called a partnership of siblings. Okay. Um, the first gen may still be in control. They may not have that title, but they still may be in control. Usually it's multiple members, brothers, sisters, you know, two to five family members. And as opposed to the first generation, which oftentimes makes decisions by intuition, gut feel, you know, I know, these, how do you, how do you make decisions with two to five people? They talk to each other and they <coughs> make a decision by consensus. And here's a good quote. They don't want the ship going down on their watch. They don't want that. They have to take care of the first gen above them that's possibly in retirement, need to keep the ship righted to, so that they have financial stability, and then the third gen is coming up, their children, and they need to take care of their households and things like that. So they feel incredible pressure. These people do not bet the farm. So they're conservative, they dislike risks. As you know, all family firms are private. They dislike going to the bank because they have to open their books. They dislike talking about how much money they make. They dislike it, okay? Um, the second gen engages in a search of information. They will talk to other people. Where the first gen, extremely private. They do not talk to other people. This generation will in, enlarge the social network that they have to make better decisions. They will talk to other people, get advice from other successful business owners, okay? When there is the luxury of time, that terminology actually came up four times in my dissertation. When I have the luxury of time, so time is a luxury to them, because they're running their business oftentimes day to day, fire drills, when they have the luxury of time to just sit on that decision and make a good decision and talk to people and arrive at consensus, and many of these second gen family uh, business owners, they try to have unanimous decisions because look we just eliminated conflict if everyone's unanimous some of them if there's four against one they will just table it and wait until that fifth person possibly comes around you can imagine the pressure on that fifth person but they'll try to have a, a, a cons they'll, they'll go with the consensus but they really rather have a unanimous decision for teamwork and uh, to avoid conflict here we go. If it is expensive, if it is risky, if it is a decision that we have never made before. Real quick, we've got program decisions and non-program decisions. Program decisions are easy. Where do we buy the copy machine paper? Well, we buy it from the same place we bought it from last time. That's easy, we don't even need to think about it. That's a program decision. A non-program decision, if it's risky, if it's expensive, we've never made that decision before. This is a big decision. Right? Um, so if you are selling something or you are asking them to do something that is expensive, that has a, lim a level of risk to it, or could possibly affect the legacy, the reputation of the family in the community, expect delays because this is where grandma comes out from around the corner and voices her concern. Okay? All right. Now let's talk about the third generation. This is called a cousin consortium. It's a bunch of cousins working together. Okay? So here we've got numerous family members. What's here? So a very famous family business consultant, some of the top, top uh, people that first started this domain of family business, let's call it, they went down to Latin America. This is a huge family business consulting group. They get paid significantly high fees. And they went down to Latin America, someplace, talking to a, com a company that was quite large. And um, they had about 100 family members on the payroll. And half of them were working. And so they immediately, as you can assume, advised the family business to fire half of the people there. And you know who got fired? <laughs> right? Because the purpose of that family business was to not make money, to employ family members. That was their mission. That was their purpose. Different purpose than a non-family firm, right? Their purpose was to employ family members and increase the financial stability of the entire family and the extended family. Okay? So imagine, you know, uh, Latin America, 
oftentimes Catholic, they tend to have large families, so everyone has 10 kids, 10 kids, 10 kids, you can see huge families. All right, so obviously we're talking about several branches of the family here. Again, decisions are delayed. They, again, first thing they think of is the legacy of grandma and grandpa. They don't want to do anything that could harm grandma and grandpa's legacy. They don't want bad publicity in the newspaper. So if it's expensive, if it's risky, if it's not common, expect delays and, again, expect hidden family members. Okay. Expect long purchase times. With that first gen founder, any, just think of your normal way of doing business and how quick they can make a decision. This is going to be delayed usually if it is expensive, if it is something having to do with the reputation of the family, if bad publicity can get out if it goes wrong, um, if it's financially <coughs> expensive, long purchase times. So how you deal with these people is if you can't get to grandma, if you can't get to those hidden decision makers, and you just can't, that's why that family retreat or sponsoring an educational component to a family council meeting or a, me a meeting, especially at retreats. At retreats, you're gonna get everybody. <coughs> Sponsor a barbecue, feed everybody, and then give a little talk. This way you get the great <coughs> okay. um, So in case you can't though, here's where you just overwhelm them with data, overwhelm them with brochures, you know whatever data that you have so that hopefully someone can pass it on to that hidden family member so that they can make an intelligent decision instead of hearing it from another family member and you know if you pass information on from one person to the next it really doesn't do a great job by the time it gets to the final person right so here how do we make decisions here there is only one way to make a decision when you've got 50 people how do you make a decision we have to do it the democratic way and it, decisions are made by voting and try to present to all of them if possible. Okay. So your mission here, especially in the third generation, is to build relationships with all of the family members. Start building relationships with the next generation that is coming up. Start building relationships so that when you're done with the client that you sold your services to, the next gen is waiting in the wings. You want to be a resource to them. You want to educate them. You want to be a help to them. And then they will continue on with you, hopefully, because you've shown them incredible value, increased their knowledge, and educated them. Okay. All right, so what advisors should do? 90% of family firms, their wealth is in the business. So I've had conversations here today and the past few days with many advisors and they say, well, you know, these family firms really aren't a big target for me because the, all their money's tied up in the business. There's really not much for me to do, right? Well, that's a problem. 90% of their wealth and potential intergenerational wealth is tied up in the business. You can be a great resource to these customers by suggesting that they diversify, right? How is dad going to retire? How is grandpa going to retire if not for you coming up with an estate plan uh, or you coming up with a retirement plan for them so that they don't have to sock their children with a huge payment to buy the business out? Ideally, when the generation in control is financially stable and just fine, they don't sell the business to their children at full price. Sometimes they just give it to them, but sometimes they sell it, but it's a pretty good deal. It's a sweetheart deal. Now, if the generation in charge has not done a good job of estate planning or retirement planning, and they need every dime from that business, now they're going to saddle the next generation with these huge payments. So, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit. So, um, you need to find out who has the real power, who has the real control, there we go, we already talked about that. Talked about that, good. All right. Unbiased. Provide unbiased and helpful educational information. Help them, because no one else is. No one is helping them. We talked about the radio and the TV. No one's helping them. So, become a trusted advisor. 
Research has shown that the CPA is the most trusted advisor. However, that is going down. The, the studies show that there is less and less um, trust with the CPA. Um, others are coming up. Okay? So your mission is to become that trusted advisor. Let's get back to that example of the gentleman that started a construction company. He knows how to frame homes, but he doesn't know how to read financial statements. Right? So they were always on the phone. I remember my dad. My dad would call up the CPA and he would ask things like, can I buy a truck? Am I making money? Can I hire somebody? He had to ask the CPA. Right? That's where the second gen comes in. They go to school. They take accounting and finance and they can be a resource to their, to their parents. Okay. All right. Here we go. Another huge opportunity for you. Family firms are two times more charitable than non-family firms. Two times. Help them create a way for them to give away the money that they are already giving away. Help them create a way to do that. Help them create a way to give more. Uh, one thing that comes to mind, extremely complicated, charitable remainder gift trust. Really cool, really cool, and these families would be all over it, okay? Help them come up with a way to do more philanthropic giving because that is a goal of theirs as a family. When you have a large family and not everyone can work in the firm, well, what they oftentimes do is start a foundation or put family members in charge of the charitable giving, which allows them to be involved in a tangible way with the business. Uh, the Cathy family. Uh, Dan Cathy uh, took over from his dad, S. Truett Cathy, and Dan had a brother, Bubba. They both were running Chick-fil-A. And um, Trudy, the daughter, she ran the charitable foundation for them. She didn't work at Chick-fil-A. She worked in the charitable foundation, and they give away a lot of money. They specialize in foster kids and camps and things like that. So again, what advisors should do? Remind them, have them start thinking now for your own business. Have them start thinking now who is going to be the successor. What are you going to do? How are you going to do this? One person cannot help them make this decision. It takes a family business advisor. It takes an exit planner. It takes the uh, CPA. It takes a C CFP. And it takes a lawyer. This is an entire team of people here. It's not something that we can just do tomorrow, right? Or we're likely to fail. So advise them to put the people that they're thinking about through a successor identification plan and then a development plan to make them the best possible CEOs they could possibly be. Okay? Again, your industry, right? Forecast their tax liabilities in the case of a transfer of ownership, right? Do some estate planning. Real estate plays a huge role here in whether mom and dad are going to have to sell the business for large dollars to their children or um, uh, give them a sweetheart deal. I'm working with one family that's, uh, again, another electrical contractor. They did $37 million last year. They're done. They want to retire. They have no children. They were going to sell the business to their employees. That didn't work out. They just got an offer on their six acres of land and their building for $28 million. They're happy with that. They're going to take that. And the business, which will need to be moved, if they get a little bit out of it, they're happy, right? The real estate was the vast majority. So if mom and dad are taken care of with the real estate alone, let alone what you do in the stock market and your other financial advice, this can really help that family have a good, successful transition to the next, next generation, okay? Uh, obviously, we do a lot with insurance and buy-sell agreements, things like that, to help facilitate this as well. There are 100 family business centers around the country attached to universities. They are resources for you to use. You can join them. Uh, in fact, you can sponsor them. I'm starting one at CBU, and I've got sponsors literally coming out of the woodwork, throwing large dollars at me because they want to associate with this, this target market, which is their target market of wealthy family business owners. Okay? Uh, it does take a team. Okay? Here we go. Here's how to pay for your fees. Here's how to pay for your services uh, for many family firms. Okay? Um, because of that term, that derogatory term of mom and pops, many family firms are embarrassed to say that they're family owned. So 
if it is a B2C company, in other words, they are a business selling to consumers and regular people will buy their products, by all means, they should advertise the fact that they are family owned. There should be a large segment on their website saying about us and introducing all of the family members and what they have done. Get, let the public know about your family, how many generations it is. Let them know all those things. Remember that high trust factor? In that same study, where it was 66% of American consumers trusted family firms rather than 32% of non-family firms, they also said that about 70% of them would spend more at a family firm rather than a non-family firm. So there is a pricing premium there. They could raise the prices. So not only are they going to get more sales if they advertise the fact that they're family owned, they actually can have them be profitable sales, okay? All right, uh, shameless plug, sorry about that. I don't know how that got up there. All right. um, <laughs> so email me please, there is my email. Email me please, I wrote an article for Financial Advisor Magazine where I think it was entitled Selling to the Family Owned Business where I talked about some of this stuff, okay? Um, email me again for the instrument that I give them when I first interview them. Uh, uh, if you have an issue with a client, um, I offer my services over WebEx or Zoom or something like that, and now we can be nationwide thanks to COVID, right? Um, so there's my email, there's my phone number, there's my, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. If you want to, I publish a lot of things, so I throw them on LinkedIn as well if you want to stay in contact there. And let's see, uh, do I have time for questions? Oh, we see that. Oh, shameless plug. We see that. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> I, I'm embarrassed. This is not supposed to be promotional. <laughs> <We're not going. laughs> I have to get over it. <laughs> yes? So, um, with, in your experience, do you find that most family businesses have a certain structure, uh, like are they C corporations or are they flow throughs? And if they're C corporations, do you find that as the generations you know, go down, are, are, the, are the new owners less likely to try to draw funds out of the corporation? Uh, great question. Great question. Um, Clark Shoe Company in the UK had 200 family shareholders. The younger family shareholder said, hey, what's with this? You're rich. We're starving to death down here, but I've been told I'm rich my whole life, and one day this will all be mine. We want some money. So they had to do some financial transactions to be able to give that upcoming generation a little money. Sometimes you have to restructure, things like that. Um, in my area, it is, I'm, I'm from the Inland Empire of, of Southern California. In my area, it is dominated. We don't have a single Fortune 500 headquartered firm there. We are dominated by small and medium-sized enterprises. So it is a lot of construction, it's a lot of manufacturing, things like that. And so you see the whole gamut from C-Corps to S-Corps to LLCs, things like that. So did that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. I'm curious, why are CPAs' influence declining? Um, the article I read, and I don't know that business, maybe you can confirm this. Are some CPAs getting into other services? Yes. Yes. And they're starting to sell things? Yes. That is the reason. That is the reason. So then they're not seen as unbiased, they're seen as selling things. So. That's why I think it's so neat that you charge a fee and you just give them advice that they need that's helpful and you're not trying to sell one thing over another for the most part, right? You're trying to do an estate plan for them. You're trying to help their retirement. You're trying to you know, um, advise that they think about the next generation. You know, Joe, how are you going to retire if you sell the business to your children. They need a plan and it's not something that we can do right this minute. It takes years. It really takes years for them to be successful. So anyway, thank you for that question. Good. And thank you for confirming the, the one article I read about it as to why. Okay. Yes. Uh, any strategy still? I'm dealing with a business owner. Uh, it's actually my dad. Uh, who, like, <laughs> <I know> <laughs> we've assembled the team, we've got the attorney, we've got the 
accountant doing the valuation, you know, I'm helping, uh, you know, guide the process too. And it's like we've just hit this wall where he just doesn't, oh, we've even found a good, we found a really good employee. My brother and I don't want it. We found a really good employee at the firm who really wants it, really does a great job. He just won't give it up. Thank you. 13% of family firm owners said, I will die here. 13%. This is their baby. Did he start that's it? Exactly. Did he yeah, start yeah, it? Yeah, and that's the way he treats it. Also like called the other woman. The spouse at oh, home uh -huh. calls the business the other woman. Yeah, that's Spends 24-7 there. My mom, too. Uh, and I told you about the controlled nature of my dad. He's 90, and he didn't give it up until health issues finally made him give it up two years ago. Um, he will die there. He still putters around there, right? Um, there's a thing called the white knight syndrome. This is interesting. So they finally do have a successful succession to the next generation, their children. And at the first sign of trouble, dad gets on his white horse with a sword and rides in like a, like a savior and saves the day, right? Well, okay, you do that twice. Maybe you even do it the third time. By then, the next generation quits in disgust and says, I just can't win. I, I gotta go, I gotta get out of here. Dad's just not letting me do it. Uh, another thing, when we do a family business center, we, we uh, have workshops where we'll separate the first gen, the CEOs, the founders into one work group. We'll separate the next gen, and then we'll separate um, non-family management because they have issues, too, associated with these people, right? But the next gens, they will complain, I don't know what's going on. Dad doesn't let me, he won't give me any responsibility. He won't let me do anything. And then over here, in the founders CEO group, my kid won't stand up to the plate. <laughs> they're so irresponsible. <laughs> and, and they're just, they're in conflict with each other. So the, the trick there, we, gotta, we have to get them talking to each other, right? We have to get them communicating to each other, okay? So, yeah, comment, comment. Um, is for, this, for this conference, look at the power of the family, look at the power of intergenerational wealth, and look at the devastation that it would cause if, say, a third generation family firm dissipated. The family togetherness could be gone. The purpose of that family could be lost. The social standing in the community of the family is devastated. Um, conflict could possibly happen. People could stop talking to each other. This is not good. This is not what God wants, right? So. We need to do a good job of helping them transfer, helping them have a succession. Any other questions? Oh, man, that's too much of a plug. There we go. There we go. So please email me. I'll send you my slides. I'll send you. Thank you.